Have you ever broken a bone? What about your face? Did you know that your face can break in patterns? Hello, I'm Masha at the Bone Museum and today we're going to talk about facial fractures. Research. Lots was done here. And today specifically, we're going to talk about René Lefort. René Lefort was a French anatomist with an interesting approach to science. He is most known for discovering the Lefort fractures, named after him. But what are they and what is their significance? Well, Lefort fractures are classifications of midline phase breaks. Sometime in his career, René Lefort set out to discover if there is a predictability to the way that the phase breaks, and he conducted experiments on cadavers in order to figure it out. He was successful and he found three different classifications to these fractures. Lefort 1, Lefort 2, and Lefort 3. Here at the museum, we actually have a skull with a Lefort two fracture, so let's take a look at it. Now let's talk a little bit about the other two fractures before we get into this one. A Lefort one fracture is the fracture of the upper jaw or the maxilla right here. It runs horizontally across the entire maxilla. A Lefort three fracture is a complete break of the face in half and usually extends horizontally right here, right across the eyes. Lefort 2 is the one that we have right here. It's also called a pyramidal fracture because the way that the face breaks, it's in a triangular shape. You can kind of see where the fracture line runs right here over the maxilla and zygomatic process. Into the eye socket, the bottom of the orbital floor right here, and then over the nose bridge. Because of the nature of his experiments, these Lefort fractures are most commonly associated with blunt force trauma. Most commonly, they are observed in car accidents due to the impact of the airbag or the seat in front of you on the face. These classifications make it easy for doctors to determine the nature of an injury and then figure out the next course of action and treatment. Rene Lefort was famous for essentially beating the crap out of the back. He would take cadavers and do all sorts of violence to them. Baseball bats, wood clubs, iron rods, doors, tables. If you can think it, Rene Laporte probably did it. While this was done in the name of science, we do not condone these actions. Please do not try this at home. And we definitely don't do any of this here. Here at the Bone Museum, we have this book, which is a direct translation of René Lefort's manuscripts and his experiments, the maxillofacial works of René Lefort. But before we dive into the book, we do have to go over some vocabulary that we're going to encounter in it frequently. Number one is dorsal decubitus. Dorsal decubitus position, also known as a supine position, is just a person laying on their back, face and chest up. An above below or a below above below is a combination of force from both above and below that results in a crushing. And last but not least, fissure, which is a crack or opening. And without further ado, let's dive in. So, I'm gonna read from the foreword really quickly. Uh, I just think that it's interesting that Rene Lefort was born on March 30th and also died on March 30th died on his birthday. So this passage is from the beginning of the book where he's just talking about how he was conducting his experiments and how he's going to be conducting them. Almost all the experiments have been carried out on entire cadavers or after decapitation. In almost all cases, after having traumatized the face or an area nearby, I sawed off the cranial wall circularly, detached the dura mater, and examined the base of the cranium in search for the possibility of a fracture there. Then the head was boiled to permit easy removal of the soft tissue. The cleaning and scraping of a fresh head before boiling or fixing is almost impossible without creating some fractures. Thin bony plates give way at the least shock. The slowness of fixation may be selected boiling. I have, however, frequently employed the former technique. So basically what he's saying is that after multiple attempts of trying to take off the flesh of a Fresh cadaver, he decided that boiling it would be easier as the flesh is softer. Before considering the details of the findings, I would like to indicate several points which have particularly struck me in the course of these experiments. The first is the intensity of a blow necessary to produce a fracture in the face. The bony mass which constitutes the upper jaw presents absolutely particular characteristics which one encounters in no other part of the body. The face is formed by columns of tissue which are more or less spongy between which very thin plates of very compact tissue are held like veils. Examination of the facial skeleton cannot give us any idea of the resistance of the entire structure. Widened preserved bones break easy at the least shock. Take a prepared skeleton and press against the canine fascia. For example, you will crush the bone more often than not without any difficulty. 
Paraskeletons in many museums frequently show losses of substance in spite of the precautions which have been taken to obtain intact specimens. On the contrary, take an entire fresh head. Subject is to diverse trauma which are not excessive, dissected. It is not cracked. Why? Because the fragile portions of the face are not readily accessible to direct trauma and the project of proportions are resistant. Because the fragile parts covered with soft tissue are well protected on all sides with a simple layer which are very resistant. In this particular portion of the book, René Lefort talks about how surprised he was with the durability of the human face. He's comparing it to the fragility of already clean skeletons which he describes as very brittle. But the soft structures like the skin and muscles that protect the skull give it more structural integrity making it harder to break. And yes, while clean skeletons are more fragile than intact ones, it is important to note that back in the day they would boil the bones, which does compromise the structural integrity, making them more brittle. And now getting to the experiments, we're going to start off with experiment number six. This was a man approximately 45 years old. The head was decapitated and partially cleaned of its soft tissue. The right side was lying on a table. Many blows with a wooden club were given on the left side of the face at the alveolar arch above it. The angle of the mandible was broken on the right. At dissection, we found a transverse fracture of the upper jaw from the nasal canal directed to the pterygoid process posteriorly where it stopped. The nasal partition had remained intact. The zygomatic process on the right, it's important to note that the blow was given on the left, was broken. Let's go over the fracture lines on the skull. The fracture starts at the alveolar process, which is right here and is the bottommost bone that cushions your teeth. It goes transverse or horizontally across the upper jaw. It goes up into the nasal canal and then also gets the zygomatic arch, which is your cheekbone right here. Now both the zygomatic arch on the left and right seem to have been broken. Experiment number eight. This was an old man, almost completely edentulous. The cadaver was in dorsal decubitus with the head laying off the table and hanging down. The mouth was wide open. A very moderate blow was given with a wooden club falling perpendicularly on the upper dental arcade that is from below above and from front to back as if the subject were standing. The blow was minimal and my assistant were persuaded that there was no lesion. On dissection, after the head had been boiled, a large crack surrounded the zygomatic bone, running from the sphenomaxillary fissure across the floor of the orbit around the zygomatic process into the canine fascia, then above the alveolar border to rise posteriorly to the posterior border of the maxilla. Couple things to point out. Edentulous means missing all of the teeth. He was almost edentulous, which means he was missing almost all of his teeth. And now let's go over the fracture. So the fracture starts at the zygomatic arch from the sphenomaxillary fissure, which is going to be around right here. It then goes across the bottom of the orbital floor. It's going to extend down into the alveolar border. And then it went up posteriorly across the maxilla. So it might seem similar to the first fracture, but let's go over it. The first fracture would have been a more thin section of the skull right here, and then a portion of your maxilla right here. This fracture involves a portion of your jaw or your mandible right here, and then also involves this entire area of the skull. Experiment number nine. This was a man approximately 45 years old. The cadaver was laid out in the preceding observation and the blow was carried out in the same way but with force. There was a sharp sensation of a bony fracture. The palatine vault was mobile and pushed back. At dissection, there were two fracture lines from the orifice of the nasal fossae running vertically in the middle of each of the bones of the nose. Then symmetrically, they ran laterally across the frontal process of the maxilla and on each side reached the nasocranial canals to pass to the floor of the orbit. From the orbit, they passed out at the suture of the zygomatic and maxillary bones. After this point, symmetry was no longer absolute. And lucky for us, there's an image in here that shows us exactly what that looked like. Followed suit by experiment number 10. This was a man approximately 45 years old. The cadaver was disposed as in the two preceding experiments and the blows carried out in the same manner. The first very minimal blow deviated to the left and produced no lesion. The second blow was much more violent. At dissection, on the right, a fissure started at the orifice of the nasal fossae under the nasal bones, crossed to the frontal process and the inferior part of the lacrimal bone, transversed the anterior part of the floor of the orbit to its mid portion, descended almost vertically through the canine fossae and fell into a gray transverse fracture. On the left, almost symmetrical lesions were seen. Let's go over what this fracture would have looked like. It would have started right here, right on the interior of the nose, 
it would have gone up into the eye socket. It would have gone over the bottom of the orbital horn and then descended down, separating this entire portion of the face. So this entire portion right here, including the inner structures of the nose would have been broken. Now this was a symmetrical fracture and because it was symmetrical, it would have gone in a pyramid shape, which is very similar to the fracture path taken by the Lefort II fracture. Now the last three experiments, they were all placed in the same position, laying down, chest up, head bent back, but they were all beaten with a different force. Skipping way ahead, we're on to experiment 24. This was an aged indentulous lady. The head, almost completely stripped of its soft tissue, was violently thrown against the rounded border of a table so that the shock was borne transversely by the left zygomatic bone. The border of the table met the bone in an oblique line from above down and from front to back. Almost all of the face exploded into three fragments which were completely detached. We're gonna focus on this specific trauma that I just read from the passage, but there is more. Now it starts off at the left cheekbone and goes again across the bottom of the eye socket. It extends into the bones near the nose right here. So all of these little small soft structures and then this portion of the bottom of the maxilla as well. So similar to the fractures that we have seen before, except this one does extend further back. And last but not least, experiment number 28, and my personal favorite. This one's gonna be nice and short. This was an aged woman. The head was placed between the jaws of a large vise and kept there with difficulty while we compressed it on each side of the zygomatic bones. The soft tissue was crushed, but whatever we did, the head slipped and escaped any true compression. So the skull was placed in a vise, which is basically a large clamp, as the vise was being clamped shut, the head somehow just slipped out. While these experiments may seem violent and harsh, they were in the name of science and they are still incredibly important for any trauma or maxillofacial surgery. They're also a key tool in forensics in order to determine the cause of trauma. We also happen to have this medallion of René Lefort. It is a nice addition to the exhibit. Our goal here at the Bone Museum is to make bones and this information more accessible to you guys and these videos is how we can make that happen. So if you like this video, make sure to like and subscribe and also follow our other socials for more amazing bone content. And if you would like to see this piece or any other pieces in our trauma exhibit for yourself, make sure to visit us in person at the Bone Museum in Brooklyn, New York.